Alan Duffy, welcome to Australia in Space TV, and uh, you're the MC for Locate 23. That's right. Delighted to be here. <laughs> Wonderful. Maybe introduce us to your role. Uh, you spoke to Enrico Palermo uh, this morning as well, the head of the Australian Space Agency. Yes. So I'd like to cover that. But yeah, just your role within space. Uh, most of us will be aware of, of who you are uh, in the mainstream media. Yeah, sure. So I occasionally pop up on TV talking yeah. about space science. Uh, I'm an astrophysics professor at Swinburne. I established our Space Technology and Industry Institute. Uh, this was designed to help companies and communities uh, uh, address their challenges on Earth through space. And then, uh, most recently, I have a new role as Pro Vice Chancellor of Flagship Initiatives. I have carriage of both space and aerospace, advancing those, but also quantum, AI, uh, uh, hydrogen, and, and a lot of other uh, uh, technology innovation areas. What's astounded me is just how much interaction there already is between those those segment areas. The, yep. the potential for quantum to revolutionize our space and, and spatial efforts, but in return, how much space and spatial is already talking and, and taking the best of those adjacent sectors and delivering solutions for those companies and communities that I referenced at the start. Nice. Are you, are you supervising PhD students and the like? Yes, or I have seven. <laughs> seven. Seven, okay, nice. Yeah. And yep. I take it they, they're quite broad domains? They cover the range. So, so I have uh, several PhD students devoted to the search for dark matter, yep. a mysterious component that, that makes up yes. five times more of the universe than anything we can see put together. That is a combination of detective physics. We go to the bottom of an active gold mine with a, a dark matter detector. Uh, we search through space imagery, seeing can we see the gravitational impacts of the dark matter uh, uh, through you know, Hubble imagery and the like, uh, known as lensing. or uh, uh, can we simulate on supercomputers different kinds of dark matter and see then the, the predictions, as it were, of how it impacts the growth of galaxies like our own Milky Way. All the way from that end to the very um, uh, uh, legalistic uh, uh, end of responsible AI in space. So we know these AI systems are being deployed. Uh, edge compute will, will just guarantee that just grows. But also the number of assets in space means the time to uh, uh, decide for a decision and particularly for humans in the loop is vanishingly small now and that will just become unfeasible. We need a better way to understand how AI systems will interact. It's not going to be a government-led initiative, it certainly won't be a United Nations treaty like the Outer Space Treaty. Yeah. Uh, it is going to be a framework, it will be a very likely an assurance framework and that's why we're partnered with EY on that project. So we try to give a handle to companies on how AI is being used in space and ways they can work better with other companies and give assurance to governments that they're just not going to be a problem customer. Fair enough. Well, I suppose it's a good segue into Locate 23 in terms of the geospatial sector mm. and the crossover with space using machine learning, AI, uh, software Absolutely. platforms. What's some of the key takeaways uh, for you today? I think it's the uh, excitement of the industry. There is a lot of activity. There are, are end users in agriculture, mining, transport and the like who are desperate for the kinds of insights that Space and Facial can provide. So we know who our end users are. There's a lot of appetite for greater collaboration across that space and spatial domain. And, and I say that intentionally as in, in the one breath because these are, these are two halves of the same coin. And the end user only cares about you, the single solution. Right? Yeah. So we have different histories and, and organizational structures that have gotten us to this point. But now this, this event in particular is showing that is a united front, as it were, in delivering for customers the insights they need. And th the example shared on stage, uh, you mentioned with Enrico, I was, I was also uh, interviewing uh, Melissa Bradley of VitGov, uh, Department Planning there. She was sharing a case study where VitGov, for the first time, as far as I'm aware at least in Australia, government use real-time satellite imagery in a flood uh, 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 disaster uh, ish, uh, period just, just uh, uh, before Christmas and they were able to provide on-the-ground teams with accurate places to, to place sandbags yeah. because that's how quick they were on getting the information of where the floods were. They had the uh, topography accurate and, and sufficiently well mapped to make predictive models all of this was this beautiful use case, and at the end, on the ground, someone was being told with authority and confidence behind, sandbag here, we're gonna protect your home. And that's what Space and Spatial is about. It is not 
the fancy assets in space, it is the on the ground solution that can save people in the, in the darkest of times. Well I think that's where AI machine learning comes into play, the, the mm. growth of our communication systems and bandwidth mm -hmm. uh, is introducing sort of low earth orbit space assets to yep. earth uh, related applications. Mm. Uh, how exciting is this for you? Any any kind of standouts? Climate change is, a, is going to be a significant one for us, yep. but I think I'm probably interested more in the market opportunities. Are you mm. seeing growth or where some of those real opportunities are? Well, look, the, j just in fact, in, in the conference beside us is, is Osmine yeah. uh, 23, and just last night, uh, a space company, Fleet, Fleet yeah. was was uh, 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 awarded the most innovative mining company award and that's because they use space assets in their case uh, uh, comms leo comms um, to relay passive sensors on the ground to, to assist the mining sector so right there the market need uh, is clear space is a, is a capability it is a domain to provide a solution it is not the solution in and of itself and i think fleet has demonstrated that beautifully they're customer orientated so they came up with a solution that managed sense for that customer now in terms of uh, uh, climate and, and other weather related activities in this instance the customer can just be the, the public what we need is government to be then more uh, forward-leaning uh, on being the procurer of such capabilities and I think there's a lot of capability out there in the Australian market right now I think if government was to uh, begin to uh, assist and, and grow the maturity of some of those companies if they feel they're not ready yet to provide them the kind of information they need for, for weather forecasting and the like, but work with them to get to that point, that's a huge market opportunity. We are talking billions of dollars a year being spent on, on purchasing, acquiring in other ways, these kinds of uh, uh, imagery and that's just going offshore. We could be doing it here. Well, I don't the, understand why we don't. The, we're just on the back of the federal budget. There was a slight mm. reduction in uh, space-related funding. Yes. I uh, understand some $70 million. Is that a bit of a red flag, do you think, from the new federal government that they may not appreciate the value of space and what it can provide and the, and the, the payback that it can provide? Look, I, I, I asked exactly this question uh, to Enrico Palermo. So that was the advantage. Head of Space Engine sitting beside me on stage. He's nowhere he can go. Um, and I asked him a, in, in, a, in a sense of, you know, who is, uh, um, who gets it within government? Yep. Uh, Defence gets it. Uh, the uh, uh, DFAT understands the impact of climate change and understands that space is a key way to monitor as well as provide adaptation mitigation uh, tool sets to our Pacific Island partner nations, for example. So those various uh, aspects of government gets it. But I think it's fair to say that there is a general... Um, uh, mis misunderstanding within the community, in government as well as public, that space means astronauts. Yeah. And it, it is partly that, but I will be honest, that is a vanishingly small aspect of it. It is a fantastically exciting, innovative and significant market opportunity. That message is beginning to be understood. I think this most recent budget just reflects the fact that there were a lot of um, uh, priorities that had to be funded. And space and, and spatial as a community, we just didn't articulate the value proposition well enough because the value proposition really is there. We are critical to an advanced nation like Australia. We've used space and spatial products half a dozen times in everyday life. But our very success as a, as a sector is how seamless that interaction is. No one knows they use space assets because we've gotten that good at providing it. Well, look, we're back to back. We have the Australian Space Forum. You've mentioned Ausmine. We're here at Loco 23. So back to back here in Adelaide uh, on very much, I think, underlines uh, the value of space and the cross-sector uh, aspect of it. So Alan Duffy, thank you very much for joining us on Australia in Space TV and well done on emceeing Loco 23. Well, it's not over yet. <laughs> I have the yeah, afternoon. you've still got a couple of sessions. <laughs> that was the plenary uh, bells yep. going off now. So Indeed. we'll let you go. I'll run. But thanks, thanks so again for, for joining us. Cheers.